So welcome everyone to 5B, Mathematical Statistical Methods session. My name is Marcela Alfaro Cordova. I'm a teaching assistant professor at UCSC. I would like to start by thanking our sponsor for this session, Roche. We are going to have three talks in the next hour, 15 minutes for each talk. And we will have a couple of questions before switching to the next talk. So please note that this session is a bit shorter than, than the parallel session. So we'll have plenty of time for questions after the third talk, if needed. Um, please feel, feel free to use the chat or the Q&A and the Slack channel, uh, um, hashtag talk underscore math underscore stats to send your questions or comments during the talk. We'll facilitate them to the speaker during the Q&A part of this session. Our first talk is Mars, Tidy Inference Under Misspecified Statistical Models in R. It will be presented by uh, two people. One is Ricardo Fogliato, and the other one is Shamindra Shrotilla from Carnegie Mellon University. About a little bit about our speakers, uh, Ricardo is a fourth year PhD student in statistics at Carnegie Mellon University, advised by Alexandra Chuldechova. His experience includes being a research fellow at the Partnership on AI. And this summer, he will be an intern at Microsoft Research, working with Pesmina Nushi and Cody Inkbe. He holds a master's degree in statistics from the University of Torino. He is interested in machine learning methods applications to the social science. Shamindra Surtilia is also a fourth year PhD student in statistics and data science at Carnegie Mellon University, advised by Professor Matei Nico. His research is focused on shape constraint estimation. He holds an MA in statistics from UC Berkeley and enjoys learning and sharing interesting things in the statistics and machine learning space in his blog. I will share the link uh, in the channel. So please join me to welcome their talk. So hi, everybody. This is a presentation of a MAS package. The name MAS stands for Models as Approximations in R. Uh, we are Ricardo and Shamindra. Uh, both of us are PhD students at Carnegie Mellon, CMU. And this joint work with uh, Arun Kumar Kuchibotla, uh, who is a faculty member in statistics at CMU. Um, and we are very excited uh, to be presenting this work today. So let's get us started. So in order to understand uh, the mass package better, we first need to revisit uh, ordinary least square regression, which is also known as OLS. So moving on to slide three, OLS is a handy tool that is uh, in every data scientist toolkit. When we take our first statistics classes on modeling, this is generally the first method uh, that we encounter. And it's just simply great. Uh, we can model so many phenomena by running OLS regression. And here, for example, we sample uh, 1,000 points uh, from a simple linear model without intercept. Uh, and we might think of employing exactly a linear regression model to describe the population level dependence of Y on X for the points represent represented in the figure. Uh, so moving on to slide four, um, in a, as in any good thing, however, there is a catch. And here we often forget that OLS is built on a series of assumptions. The inference for OLS is based on a well-specified linear model. And in the like in this figure, the blue line represents the fitted regression line, whereas like the red lines represent 95% confidence intervals for the residuals. And this in violation of one of the, of the OLS assumptions, which is homoscedasticity. Indeed, uh, like uh, there is no constant variability is uh, actually something that really happens in practice. So moving on to slide five, uh, the real question is now, can we still make inference uh, on the coefficient of interest, even if one of, of the OLS assumptions is not met? So after having fitted a model without intercept on the data, the LM, we can call confident uh, to get the 95% confidence intervals for this coefficient estimates. And the confidence interval assumes uh, homoscedasticity, that is a constant rotational variance, uh, that in this case we do not have. Um, therefore, like once we actually check for coverage uh, based on multiple replications, uh, we find out that it's uh, below 90%. This means that if we generate the data and fit the model uh, 100 times, this interval will contain the true parameter in less than 90 cases in expectation. 
And this behavior is absolutely undesirable. So moving on to slide six, then how can we actually make inference when we are dealing with models that do not satisfy all of the OLS assumptions? And luckily, there are some excellent packages uh, such as uh, CAR, CLEP Sandwich, uh, LM Test Sandwich, uh, and others for performing OLS inference under model misspecification. Uh, now we have the mass R package, uh, the package that we are introducing as well. So I'll pass it on to Sherinda now. Thanks, Ricardo. Moving to slide seven, MAR stands for Models as Approximations in R, and it's been inspired by the discussion papers written by a group of statisticians at Wharton. These papers have been recently published in Statistical Science, and we highly recommend reading them. Going back to the packages Ricardo just mentioned, given that the, these existing R packages are so great, why create a new MARS package? Now, let's turn our attention to the MARS package and its features. Moving on to slide eight. The MARS package comes batteries included with a rich set of inferential tools for OLS under model misspecification. These inferential tools fall into three main categories. First, on the left, we have the closed form variance estimators, which are computed by default. I, that is the LM and sandwich based standard errors. Second, in the middle, we have the resampling based estimators, which also help you diagnose convergence to normality. These include the empirical multiplier residual bootstrap and subsampling based methods. Third, on the right, we provide by default valid hypothesis testing under model misspecification, that is chi squared tests rather than F, -square, F tests that are reported and also some experimental model misspecification diagnostic tools, including nonlinearity detection. We note importantly that LM variance and the residual bootstrap highlighted in yellow are only valid under the full OLS assumptions. The remaining variance types perform valid inference under complete model misspecification. Most importantly, from a user perspective, all of these tools are accessible by our single COMFAR function which is set up for more such tools in the future. Moreover, the output of the COMVAR function readily allows for a quick comparison of all of these estimators, thus leading to misspecification diagnostics. Moving on to slide nine. So although having such inferential tools is helpful to the data scientists, what really distinguishes Mars from other packages? The key idea which makes Mars unique is its strong emphasis on pedagogy not just on research. We make this pedagogical emphasis clear to new users in three key ways. First, on the left, Mars explicitly allows the user to print the inferential assumptions for the different variance estimators. This is meant to minimize the time overhead for the data scientists, specifically so that they don't have to keep spending time looking up research papers, uh, which discuss the assumptions behind the different estimators and their validity for inference. By making these assumptions explicit in our output, we hope that it makes these tools less intimidating and accessible to new users. Second, in the middle, we try to explicitly emphasize teaching these deep concepts to new users by example. We do this mainly through writing very detailed vignettes. These come in two main forms. The first is where we take research papers on similar topics and reproduce tables and plots from them. Again, increasing the accessibility for the data scientists to the research literature. Second, we provide lesson plans through vignettes. For example, we know empirical and multiplier bootstrap are valid under model misspecification, but how different are they in practice? We can use Mars to, systemat to conduct systematic simulations and provide de a detailed comparison between these estimators via our lesson plan vignettes. Third, on the right, Mars follows tidy principle in its function namings and its focus on returning tidy tibbles for easy downstream analysis. Let's see what we mean specifically by this in the next slide. So moving on to slide 10, before seeing Mars demoed in action, it is worth quickly describing what we mean by our tidy Mars grammar. The main idea here is that Mars code for performing OLS inference under model misspecification should ideally be written and read as prose, read left to right, top to bottom. We note that this idea is not new and we were inspired by the tidyverse and similar packages. In our Mars grammar, on the left, we see that the main nouns are the LM and the Mars LM objects. In the middle are our verbs, 
which are the MARS functions which act on these noun objects. These include generic methods such as summary, print, confint, etc. We also have tidy analog for each of these methods, which follow the get underscore prefix. This reminds the user that the object return is a tidy tibble, similar to the broom package. We name Mars functions using this con consistent convention so that both reading and writing Mars code aligns with the communication of these ideas. Lastly, on the right, we see that code composition in Mars becomes easy using the Magrita pipe operator, so that these deep statistical and econometric ideas can be communicated easily as prose. Moving on. So to slide 11, we have discussed the key principles upon which Mars is based till now. It's now time to get our hands uh, to get hands on and see briefly what a Mars workflow looks like. So moving on to slide 12. To begin our demo, we will work in a simulated setting. Recall the simple toy simulated example that Ricardo presented earlier. Here we generate data from a linear model with heteroscedastic noise, where the variance is not equal. For interest, on the left is what the R code. Uh, used to generate this type of plot looks like. So how would we go about modeling this type of relationship? In the next slide, 13, since we know and believe that the data is generated from a linear model, we can start by running the LM workflow that we know. By running the usual, and we see this here, uh, we run Y on X without intercept. By running the usual summary command on our fitted LM object, we get that the OLS estimate of our coefficient is indeed correct. But of course, as shown earlier, the standard errors don't provide the appropriate coverage of the true parameter anymore. So how can we now use Mars to perform inference in this situation? We'll see this in the next slide. So we note that every Mars workflow begins with fitting LM as we just did. Next, we take our LM object and pipe it into compvar, the most important function in Mars. This creates a new object of class, class Mars LM, in this case named Mars fit. The compvar design is very simple. And in this case, we ask it for the empirical bootstrap, multiplier bootstrap, and residual bootstrap standard errors to be computed with a thousand replications each. In this case, we created our Mars object implicitly using many default inferential assumptions. How can we explicitly check what these assumptions are? We just print out Mars fitted object. And on the right, we see that the print method explicitly conveys the inferential assumptions used and even reveals what default assumptions were run. In this case, for example, multiplier bootstrap was run using default rider marker weights. We built this feature for ourselves in the development process, but many users like that the object made these inferential assumptions explicit. We hope that this catches on in the R community and more assumptions behind statistical objects are made explicit through the generic print methods. I'll now pass back to R Ricardo to describe more Mars methods. Well, thank you, Shamindra. So moving on to slide 15. Um, most of the generic methods that are currently implemented in Mars also have tidy analogs. So for example, uh, when we, we can call the typical summary method also on a Mars object, and this summary method does exactly what we would normally expect from calling summary on an LM object. It just looks a bit nicer, at least we think it's nicer. Uh, our summary displays the assumptions uh, together with both the coefficients estimates, the standard error estimates, p-values, and so on. However, we can also obtain similar information in the form of a table by calling the get summary function. Uh, do we, we say that get summary is a tiny analog of summary? And the idea of the analogs extends well beyond the summary. So moving on to slide 16, Again, like we try to embrace the tidy workflow, and here is another example uh, where we call the get plot function on a mass object to obtain eight model diagnostics. So six of these diagnostics are the same that you would get from calling plot on an LM object, plus two additional diagnostics. The first of these two diagnostics is shown here, and in this plot, A displays the confidence intervals for the estimates of the coefficients. And each interval is based on a different type of method for computing the variance. And so all the, all the bootstraps methods, and as we might expect, we see that the intervals uh, will differ. Um, so moving on to size 17, 
like this was a very quick dive uh, into Mass, and we have absolutely not covered uh, all of its functionalities. Uh, but what are some uh, key upcoming features uh, that we have in our pipeline? So first, we plan to polish documentation and features, uh, which includes making our code faster by, par by parallelizing it and other, other things. And we also plan to spend some time developing user-friendly vignettes. Then we also are going to spend some time on new functionalities, such as ANOVA, which we are currently working on, and using conformal inference for predictions. Uh, lastly, one very important element is that uh, we want to extend the package beyond just OLS, so in order to include also GLM and other models. So moving on to slide 18, these are some of the references to the papers that we cited in the presentation and that have also inspired us. And moving on to slide 19, the last slide. To conclude, you can install our package mass uh, from PAC or through DevTools, and we will also soon uh, push the package onto CRAN as well. Um, so we would truly love your feedback. Uh, so please try our package. Let us know what you think. Uh, feel free to open an issue. Don't hesitate at all. And also feel free to make a contribution. And thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you so much, um, Ricardo and, and Shamindra. So we have time for one question. I still do not see questions on the Q&A, but I will invite you to pose your questions uh, either in the Q&A or in the Slack channel. Um, I do have one question and is if you have tried Mars for teaching and if so, what kind of classes and how? Uh, yeah, so uh, basically we haven't yet tried it for teaching. However, next semester, uh, we're planning to actually teach it in a course with Professor Arun Kumar Kuchibotla. Um, so Mars grew out of a course, the same course that we did last year that Ricardo and I did. And we developed Mars to teach ourselves the concepts from that course. And in the fall, we're planning to teach a couple of lessons in that class. Um, and use it as a pilot case. That sounds great. And another question is, as busy grad students, um, how do you find time to write a package? And you you already explained your motivation, but I, I know from what I remember in grad school, you have a lot of things to do. So how did you find time to write a package? Yes, it's uh, definitely a great question and very slowly, <laughs> taking it very slowly. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's a side project for both of us and we're doing it mostly for fun. Um, so it's been like we started in October and then we have moments in which during which we work a lot on it. And then like now we, I mean, I'm, I'm an internship, I mean, this work on research and like we are like for a month has been stalling. Um, so I guess, uh, yeah, very slowly, but steadily. I'll just uh, add on that. Um, if you do want to help us uh, build the package, uh, feel free to open an issue. We're really friendly and we're happy to take on contributions. <laughs> Sounds great. And congrats on, on the good work. Uh, thank you so much, both of you. Okay, so thank you. Moving on to our second talk, uh, please join me to welcome Martin Binker from LMU Munich, uh, Germany who will present mixer, mixer in, integer evolutionary strategies with Ms. Mushu. Martin is a third year PhD scientist at the Statistical Learning and Data Science Department from the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. He is interested in automatic feature preprocessing, feature extraction and model selection. He is the main author of uh, MLR CPO and MLR3 pipelines, both are software packages for data pre-processing within machine learning pipelines. Before finding his way into computational statistics and machine learning, Martin obtained a math degree in theoretical physics and a master in science degree in biostatistics. Martin, the mic is yours. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. And welcome everybody to my presentation for my R package Mies Mosche, which uh, contains the letters MIES, which is for Mixed Integer Evolution Strategies. In the beginning, first, 
Um, you can find my package on, on GitHub as Miesmuschel. It has uh, both documentation, it has, it's very well tested, and you can actually install it and run it. And if you're watching this video later and on, on YouTube or somewhere, you can actually download this and, and follow along to some of the code. So first, what is Miesmuschel, except uh, besides being a abbreviation here, it is also a German word for um, a mollusk, which Wikipedia tells me is uh, blue mussels in English. You can, well, they look like this usually when you, when you see them in the wild, they look very similar. And it's, this is the kind of word I always think about when I read the MIES abbreviation, so I named the package like this. So how is this, the presentation going to proceed? First, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about evolution uh, evolution strategies in general and about optimization in general. And then I'm going to um, show how Mies Muschel works. So first it's building blocks, the operators, then how to use it. And then a very interesting um, case, use case for Mies Muschel where we can actually combine operators to work in more on, on more interesting optimization spaces than many other optimization methods allow. And finally, I'm going to give some outlook on what I plan to do with the package and where the, the um, work is heading. So first, optimization. Optimization we do in a lot of um, parts of engineering and science, data science in particular, where we have some kind of function, and function is a very general word here, so something where you have some kind of input that produces some kind of output. And you desire a output to be as big as possible or as small as possible. So these um, functions in particular were just examples. You don't need to remember the formula, but remember that we have some kind of process that gives us a scalar output and the input, we have some kind of boundaries on these. So, so some kind of constraints. So in our example, we have two dimensions, X and Y, and we have a function that produces some kind of output. And here we're trying to maximize this output. So we're basically trying to climb this hill. So evolution strategies are now a population-based optimization method that tries to, in some way, imitate natural evolution. So in natural evolution, we have a population of individuals that have produced children in some way, and these children are similar to their parents, but not completely similar. And out of these children, some of them are more likely to survive than others. So the more fit individuals survive, and over time, you get individuals that are more adapted to the environment that they live in. So our um, method, which is an abstraction of that, or which tries to imitate it, that in some way works as follows. So at first, we have some kind of initial, what we call population. And these populations consist of individuals. So here, this is a table with some rows. And you can imagine these are just points in your search space, and these are individuals that in some way live and they tend to have some kind of fitness. And the fitness we get from evaluating the function just on these x values. So this is our first step that we do. We initialize our population by randomly sampling and evaluating. Now we do the optimization procedure. So we iterate the, some, some steps over and over where we have we generate offspring in some way, and this, and this offspring then generates offspring again, and so on. So first, we have to look which are the lucky individuals that get children. These, this we might select just completely randomly, or we might go by how well the, they perform. And these uh, parent individuals are now going to produce children. So this is our first step, selecting parents. Second step would be to have some kind of crossover. So the Parent individuals have some interesting times together, and they in some way mix their genetic material. And this might, for example, look like crossing over some of these values here. And, but it might be like, this is a very general thing, so it could mean anything that in some way mixes this information, or it might not even mix the information. And so this is our second operation. Finally, we might have some mutation. So we in some way permutate the genetic information a little bit, so we get individuals that are not really an average of these two parent individuals, but they're in some way a little bit different because we actually want to explore the search space. So all of this has now produced ch child individuals that we add to our population. And we record 
which generation each individual belongs to, because it might be interesting later. Of these, we now evaluate the performance. So we have to apply this function in some way. So we might just run an R function, but it would, could actually mean that someone somewhere runs an experiment. And finally, we have to choose which individuals survive. So maybe we kill the individuals with the worst performance. We might have some randomness in this process. We are also going to record when individuals died. And this is our final step. And now we repeat this process. So we generate new individuals and kill old ones and do this again and do it again. And we hope that this process in some way is going to find um, regions of our search space where the performance is quite well. So how are we going to do this in R? In R, we, we can well use some, some packages. I hope you consider using Miesmuscher here. Miesmuscher is a new package that is built on the MLR3 ecosystem, which you can ideally Google it, but you can also visit this link. So this um, MLR3 is for uh, mainly a machine learning, or originally it was a machine learning ecosystem, but it also contains lots of optimization because optimization is very relevant for machine learning. So, and this is the, um, the it gives us some building blocks on which MiesMuschel is, is building. MiesMuschel is inspired by the ECR, on, on Kran it's called ECR, on GitHub it's called ECR2 package by Jakob Bosek. So, this is, I've um, worked with this package before. It does some things. I mean, it's, it's a very good package, but um, MiesMuschel is trying to expand the possibilities of that, or is, is, uh, is trying to go beyond what, what this package offers. Most interestingly, um, MiesMuschel is based on R6. So most things you see in MiesMuschel are R6 objects, which has, if you've worked with R6 before, then you know it has some, some nice benefits. And MiesMuschel gives you two ways of using it. So you could use some pre-specified algorithms that are given by MiesMuschel. And well, these you just run and you get the result, which is nice. But you can also use the building blocks of MiesMuschel themselves and basically build your own optimization algorithm. The main part of MiesMuschel, which you're going to be using, are the operators, which I'm going to be showing now. Operators represent the individual steps that I've shown before while presenting the optimization process. You get, well, operators are R6 objects, which you get by um, calling accessor functions. So these are quick access functions that give you operators that you can use. And these operators work on data frames of individuals. So the table you saw here earlier, these are collections of individuals. So these are just tables that you feed into operators. And they return, either they return new individuals, which are just the modified ones, or they, the selection operators, they give you the indices of the selected operators. So if you wanted to use an operator, you could just get one using this quick access function. You, could, you would have to, um, well, tell this operator on what search space it's actually working on. And then you could just call the operate function. And it gives you, for example, if you have like a data frame, with a very round numbers, you do the Gaussian mutation, then you get a data frame that has slightly modified values, which is what mutation is supposed to be doing. And this is a nice picture of that. Um, most of the time you would be using functions that abbreviate all of this. One quick word on um, some things that we uh, give you that are given by the MLR3 ecosystem. So BBOTK is the package is the name of the package, which gives us some things that like some some objects we need to operate on. For example, the objective function, or the uh, information about what kind of individuals have been operated on uh, have been evaluated, evaluated before and what their performance was. So how do we run MiesMuschel? So there's, as I said, there are two ways. So first, the complicated way, which means we have to, um, we, uh, we basically do all these operations, we build our own algorithm. But even that is quite easy. We select some operators and we, all the steps that I showed before, they have a corresponding function which you can call. So we prime, which is a new method, um, thing. We initialize the population. We generate offspring. We get some offspring variable. We can evaluate the offspring, so we get the objective value. 
and we can do survival, which kills off some of our individuals. And this we can just repeat over and over in a repeat function until we get some termination error, which is just a signal that tells us we've op um, optimized to the end and we're done. But there's also the quick and easy way of calling these modules. So if you have your operators defined, then you can just get an optimizer that uses all these operators and this optimizer does the optimization loop for you. So, um, and we have this short form for that that gives, us, gives this um, optimizer very quickly. We can even modify this optimizer in some way, so it has hyperparameters. After we got our BBOTK optimization instance, we can just call optimize and it does all of this for us and we're done. So, um, so one thing I'm going to skip over a bit is that these operators, they come in various shapes and forms, they do different stuff, but there are also operators that combine other operators. So we could combine operators that then work on different parts of our search space. So for example, if we have an operator that is supposed to be doing mutation to some numeric mutation by Gaussian um, change on the numeric parameters, but flip bits of logical parts of our search space, then we can use a certain um, uh, mutator operators that are built together from other components. And this is going to be very daunting when you look at see it the first time, but actually what is being built is very um, logical and it's, it's very physical. You have the feeling that you actually have things in your hand that you can work with and that are um, things that like that have a physics to them. So I think it's very intuitive to work with this. And if we, if we do this, we can actually put it into our operator and into our um, optimizer and it does some optimization for us, even on search spaces that, have, that are not purely numeric. So where is uh, all of this going and what are things that are, I'm happy about that I'm, well, by far don't have enough time to show. So one thing that is already implemented is self-adaption. So we can, these uh, parameters, they can change, uh, the, the hyperparameters of the operators, they can change themselves during the optimization process. And so there's a, a very nice paper that actually introduces the Timex integer evolution strategies where they, they use the self-adaption and you can actually do this in, in Mies Moshe. Something else is that it allow, Mies Moshe can do multi-fidelity optimization. So we can selective t selectively evaluate our performance measure or fitness function more closely for some individuals than for others. Finally, we also have multi-objective optimization. This is not on the main branch yet, but it's definitely possible and so it's being used in experiments where we um, build, um, have multiple performance measures that we try to optimize. And so we try to find individuals that in some way are somewhere on this front of possible um, performance values, but um, where we don't say a priori which performance is more important than the other. So as I already said, Mies Muschel is very well documented. I, I think it's very well tested. And it should be on CRAN soon. Currently, I'm still working on the multi-objective part. And um, so some parts of these are more likely to change than others, to be honest. So the core MIS is, I think, works very well. Um, I think, for example, the multi-fidelity part of it might still change a little bit. But I definitely think you can already use this in your experiments. And soon, you should be able to just download it from CRAN. But currently, you have to install it from GitHub using this command, which I hope I've inspired you to, to use now. I uh, thank you very much to listen, for listening to my talk. Maybe when you're look, listening to this on YouTube later, you might actually already be install, uh, installing it from CRAN. And I'm looking forward to um, well, get, getting lots of visitors on my GitHub page and uh, getting lots of feedback about users who might be well, who might want their own wishes fulfilled by Mies Moshe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. Um, just as a reminder, before we continue, 
you can post uh, your questions on our channel in Slack or using the Q&A function in this webinar. So we, one, one of the questions, this, this, you, you said it, it, it was inspired by biological evolution, but what, are there any applications that, that you have tried this package outside of biological evolution? So I'm, I'm, we're currently using this package in our group actually on, on, on research. There's um, one, so um, the nice thing about these uh, evolution strategies is that they work quite well in our experience with uh, search spaces that are kind of complicated. So they have large um, numbers of um, like parameters, like a large number of dimensions, for example. I've used a very similar method, which is not implemented yet in MISMOSHA, but which was actually prompted me to develop MISMOSHA. I've used it for doing automated feature selection and uh, combined with hyperparameter optimization in machine learning. So this, this tended to work well when I, when I use basically the selected features of a data set that I'm doing machine learning on as a um, genotype and using the machine learning performance as the fitness that I'm trying to optimize. Very interesting. Um, so we're going to give people a bit more time to, to pose questions because we already have uh, one question for the previous presenter. <laughs> and so we'll leave uh, the rest of your questions for the end of, of this session, if that's all right. Thank you so much again. And um, now we are welcoming Sevandi Kandanarachi. Uh, from our MIT University, who will be presenting, here is the anomaly down. About our speaker, Sevandi is a lecturer and applied, an applied mathematician in the mathematical science department from our MIT University. She has a PhD in, in mathematics from Monash University, Australia. Sevandi uses statistics, mathematics, and machine learning to find unusual patterns in data. She also likes working on real-world problems, especially ones that are motivated by industry. From 2016 to 2019, she worked with an industry partner on intrusion detection. Please join me to welcome Sevandi. Hello, everyone. I'm Sevandi, and I'm going to talk about anomalies. This is joint work with Rob Heinemann. So, why are we interested about anomalies? We're interested because they tell us a different story. So, for example, uh, think of the fraudulent credit card transactions among billions of legitimate transactions, or computer network intrusions, or astronomical anomalies like solar flares, or weather anomalies like tsunamis, or stock market anomalies. Are they heralding a stock market crash? So all, there are all types of anomalies uh, and anomalies there in different, different applications, right? So uh, why are we interested in anomaly detection? Say, for example, take, uh, take fraud or credit card fraud or network intrusions, right? Take that as an example. So suppose we train a model on certain types of fraud or like you know these are these are the telltale signatures of this fraud or these are the telltale signatures of of uh, cyber attacks which are really anomalous because there are millions of billions of legitimate transactions going on so but there can always be be a new attack a new fraud and you, your model would not know it because your model is looking for certain types of things Right. So, but if you have a way of, you, you know, but so what you want is you want to detect when really different things happen, when really weird things happen. So these are, you want to detect anomalous behavior because these anomalous behavior might have some really cool meaning in it because they're telling us a different story, such as fraudulent credit card transactions or network intrusions, right? So anomaly detection is used a lot uh, in these applications. So is everything done or is everything rosy? Well, hardly. There are some big challenges in this field. And um, one of the main things is the high dimensionality of data. 
this is a this is a challenge in lots of data analytics and machine learning. So when data is really in high dimensions, finding anomalies is hard. Why anomalies look like normal points and normal po like sort of you know you can't really distinguish there the distances between anomalies and other points are similar the clustering is similar the density is similar so high dimensional data is a problem. Then there are other things. So high dimensional data is a problem for many um, for many uh, machine learning tasks. And so there are other problems as well, such as uh, high false positives. So with anomalies, uh, like say, for example, if you're talking about credit card transactions or intrusions, uh, you don't want uh, your application or your underlying algorithm to be an alarm factory, right? So think of a situation where you've got, uh, you've got a camera and you've got a camera outside your home and it's just you know look taking the video and then it's it's uh, it, it alarms if if a burglar comes in or something like that right uh, but if this camera uh, sorry if the alarm goes off every like every night at 2 a.m or something like that and then this is because there's a uh, there's a, a, a possible Right, you know, or, or, or some such thing. It just becomes an awe, like every time there's a, you know, wind blows and then the camera, the, when then the alarm goes off, then it's just a nuisance, right? You don't want to, you, you don't want that to happen and it just becomes an alarm factory and the confidence system in the, go, confidence in the system goes down and you're going to switch it off and you're not going to, you know, take that seriously. You, you don't want that to happen. And that's why high false positives are a real problem. Uh, the the other thing is parameters need to be defined by the user in many uh, algorithms. So uh, and and that is again a problem because uh, you know uh, some people are, are devising the algorithms and the user doesn't really know what these parameters are doing inside the algorithm, but the user has to set the parameters that are suitable for them, and that that, that is another problem. So these are some of the challenges and in today's talk what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about two, two R packages that we've done. So one is Dobbin. Dobbin is a dimension reduction method suitable for outlier detection, right? So Dobbin addresses the high dimensionality challenge. So it, it's a little bit like PCA, it gives you a different set of basis vectors like IJK or E1, E2, E3. It gives you a different set of basis vectors such that the outliers or the anomalies are highlighted. So that's Dobbin. And the other one is Lookout. So Lookout, uh, Lookout has low false positives. And uh, so Lookout is an anomaly detection method that has low false positives. And the user doesn't need to specify parameters. Both packages are on CRAN. So to start off with Dobbin, this is um, a paper uh, uh, by Rob and me, and it's uh, on um, it's published in JCGS, uh, and that's a sticker. So uh, look how it is a pre-processing technique. It's not an anomaly detection method. Right. So what we're making sure is the original anomalies in the original the, the anomalies in the original space are still anomalies in the reduced dimensional space. So that's that's the key. So what what does it do? So it finds a set of new axes or basis vectors which preserves anomalies. So it is in that sense it's a little bit like PCA, right? So you have these, you have your stat, like you know, starting off axis, and then it finds, ooh, if you have these axis this way, then the anomalies, you're putting a spotlight on the anomalies. And by doing that you can use fewer axis vectors and use it for anomaly detection. So so the first basis vector is in the direction of most anomalousness. That is, we're taking the largest KNN distances and we're finding the first basis vector in that. The second basis vector is in the direction of the second largest KNN distances and so on. So just to give a little example, so uh, we consider uh, 
a uniform distribution in 20 dimensions and let's say there's a point at uh, there's one point at 0 0.9 0 0.9 0 0.9 0 0.9 until in all 20 dimensions this is the outlier because this point is far away from all other points now if you traditionally do do pca if you traditionally do pca that's where that point comes out this point at 0 0.9 0 0.9 0 0.9 so this is a uniform demand a uniform distribution but if you do dobbing that's where the point comes out so that point lies really far away and you know using two axes so this is we're reducing the dimension from 20 to 2. so in our you just use uh, uh dobbing uh like you know here like this dobbing uh of x and that's the cause you know so the next one is look out so we this is leave one out we're using leave one out kernel density estimates for outlier detection or anomaly detection this is a preprint again a bit drop and that's a sticker so uh for lookout lookout is an outlier detection method and uh, uh and and the main things of this method is uh, the false positives are low because we use extreme value theory that is the reason that false positives are low. And extreme value theory is used to model 100 year floods, like really extreme events. And then we use a generalized Pareto distribution uh, uh, in lookout. So, we, so the, the plus point is it's not an alarm factory. So lookout, uh, I'll need to keep moving this, sorry. Uh, Look out, and also the other thing is the user does not need to specify parameters. So look out uses kernel density estimates. For to use kernel density estimates, we need a bandwidth parameter. But the bandwidth, that's the general bandwidth that is there to represent the data, is not really good for anomaly detection. Uh, so what we do is we select bandwidth using topological data analysis methods, which is actually persistent homology. That's what happens inside Lookout. So first of all, we find a bandwidth using a TDA, topological data analysis, and then using this bandwidth, we find the kernel density estimates. Using the kernel density estimates, we uh, use extreme value theory and then find outliers. Okay, we model it using extreme value theory. So, uh, so that's what Lookout does, uh, and more details are available in the preprint. And then there's, we also introduce something called anomaly persistence. So anomaly persistence is which anomalies are constantly identified when we change the bandwidth, because bandwidth is the key parameter. If you, if you change the bandwidth, what are the anomalies that are constantly identified? These are consistently identified, right? These are persisting anomalies. Okay, so we, so that that gives the overall picture of the data set you have, right? So that is kind of a little bit independent of the uh, parameters that you've chosen. So, for example, let's look at a couple of examples. Here we have a two-dimensional normal distributions with a bunch of outliers or anomalies at the far end. And look how it identifies these anomalies. That's why they are red. And this is the strength of the anomalies. So it identifies these anomalies with very high strength, but it also identifies this other point here. This is slightly yellow with low strength. The indices of the anomalies are 505 to 500, 501 to 505. That is to say, in the data set, I've placed the anomalies at the very end. And this is the anomaly persistence diagram. Right. So the anomaly persistent diagram, uh, the the outliers. They, so for early, uh, for for early, uh, the uh, for, for low bandwidth values, uh, for low bandwidth values, uh, there are many points I gets identified as outliers. But as the bandwidth increases, only those points get identified as outliers. And this is the bandwidth uh, uh, chosen by Lookout, right? So the, the one with the dashed line. So going on to the next example, uh, so here we have a bimodal distribution with some outliers in the middle. And again, Lookout identifies them with high strength, but also identifies this point 
as an outlier and that point as an outlier with low strength those are the that is the anomaly scores are low for those points right and then again the outliers are placed from 1001 to 1005 that's at the end of the data set because this is a data set with 1005 points and we see these are the ind indices of the uh, observations and we see that again, these ones are identified as anomalies for a very, as we change the bandwidth, x axis is the bandwidth, as we keep on increasing the bandwidth, they're identified as anomalies. And for very small bandwidths, lots of anomalies are identified, but as we increase it, they drop, and that's the uh, bandwidth chosen by Lookup. Another example, so here we have three uh, normally uh, uh, three clusters and each of them are normally distributed and some outliers there. And uh, look how it identifies those and identifies this, that point and that point. Right, so look how it identifies these as outliers. And um, so the anomalies have these indices and we see again that they, you know, I've always in the data set, I've placed the anomalies at the very end. So uh, they identified them for very long, uh, you know, a long range of bandwidth values and for early bandwidth values, there are lots, but you see these other points like that point, which is corresponding to that, or is also identified as an outlier at the current bandwidth, but then if you keep on increasing the bandwidth after that point, it ceases to be an anomaly. Right. And uh, so uh, this example, uh, so this is points are placed in an annulus. And here we have some anomalies in the middle. We have 10 anomalies placed in the middle, which look how it identifies. That's why they're in red, because that's the strength. And if we keep on uh, increasing the bandwidth, uh, this is this is the bandwidth that Lookout picks, the, the one in the dash line. But if we keep increasing the bandwidth, again, those points are identified as anomalies for very large bandwidth values and, you know, for a range of bandwidth values. Uh, and But we have this point as well, which is identified. And that point corresponds to either this point here, which is... Uh, identified with a low score or that point there, right? So there are some other points that are also, uh, you know, identified, which but with low strengths. So in summary, I've talked about two things. One is Dobbin. This is a pre-processing step for, but specially catered for outlier detection. Uh, uh, and it's a dimension reduction method. Uh, and then look out is an extreme value theory based method to find anomalies. Uh, both paper and preprint are available and both packages are on, on CRAN. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Selandi. Um, so another reminder that we have both the channel on Slack and the Q&A. Uh, we have one question in the Q&A from Andy. <laughs> Uh, in many of the examples, the anomalies show up with high bandwidth. Why not just use high bandwidth to detect? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah, true. The thing is this, though. Um, uh, if you... Uh, it's generally high bandwidth, but there is kind of a Goldilocks range. So you, we start with very small bandwidths, and then everything gets detected as anomalies. And then there's a range of nice bandwidth values where the actual anomalies get detected in the, in the, as anomalies. And then after that value, then nothing gets detected, right? So, so we need to pick up that kind of Goldilocks range. That's the reason that Lookout is looking at that particular data and doing this topological data analysis procedure underneath to find this big, bad, uh, generally decent bandwidth value. Because if you just pick a massive one, you're not going to get anything. Okay. Does that answer the question? He said, thanks. <laughs> okay. So we have another question on the Slack channel. Uh, from Jeffrey Hilton, what sorts of analyses are left to us following the anomaly detection given the small sample size we are left with? Are there any quantitative methods available to us? Or is this the case where a closer, more qualitative analysis is more practical? 
Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Marcella. So I can I can't see. So this is in the chat, right? Because if it's really good, if I see the question. Oh, uh, let me let me. This is in the yeah. chat on Slack or on. It's on the channel in Slack. Uh, but I, I see. I paste it on the on the chat in here. And I see. Okay. Okay. Uh, what sort of analysis are left for us following the? Uh, given the small sample size, we are left with right. So so uh, so this is. Um, so the, the, say, the thing is, um, anomaly detection things are used ki kind of uh, like to flag things, like say, so in a real, in a real scenario, say you are monitoring uh, a, a, a traffic in a, uh, in a computer network, and then you see really a node behaving really anomalously. That might be because it's trying to hack, or it's being hacked, it's like sending things everywhere, or it's like really doing something very different than the others do. So in a, in a real world scenario, it's a flag and a warning and needs to be investigated. Right. Unless it's it's unless you know more about anomalies in a way like oh the this is uh, the, the un, unless you you know more about it it's then it, then that that is to say it's not just from the uh, knowledge from anomaly detection but from from some background knowledge that you have the contextual knowledge on the application that you say oh that is an attacker that's what it's doing and bang you go and stop it or block it like really quickly. But but generally, you would have you'd be in a scenario saying, "Hmm, that's different. Should we should investigate that?" That that is general uh, uh, scenario. Just looking at the anomaly detection framework, but putting in the uh, putting in the domain knowledge, you might have more stuff. Like for example, in a uh, in a sensor, water quality sensor, or something like that, that is deployed in a river. If the if the anomalies are of a certain type, you might think, "Who? That is because the batteries are dying down." Or, or you know that's a telltale signature, and that's that that kind of anomalies. Or maybe the scent, the what the quality sensor, which was supposed to be beneath the water, has come out of the water because the the uh, of the water level has gone down, and then it's behaving really weird. So you you know so unless you have so that's coming from the domain knowledge, uh, but uh, uh, without any domain knowledge it's difficult to go to an action plan. But these are kind of flagging, which were the next ones to look at for you to like, because when there's so much of data coming in, you, you need to have like a short list. These are the weird ones, like, you know, things like that. Yeah. D does that okay, uh, uh, Jeffrey? I think, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> so, Thank you so much, Sivandi. Now I have one more question for you, but I'm going to save it um, for the for the panel. So can we have uh, all the stickers from before? Uh, Ricardo, Shamira, Martin. Great, thank you. So um, I'm going to give a couple of more minutes for people to, to post their questions on the Slack channel or in the Q&A. I do have one question from the Slack channel uh, to the first presenters. I think they already uh, answered on Slack, but I would like to share that question with the audience on YouTube. Um, Jeremy Selva is asking if Marit is able to tell me, if tell him, if our wrong model is used like the reset test and Rabel test from the LM test packages. And I believe you have an answer, uh, Ricardo or Samindra. Right, uh, thank you. Uh, so the, yeah, the answer is at the moment, no, uh, we don't have to test, um, but we have some other tests uh, for non-linearity detection uh, that have been presented in the two, pa two papers that we refer to. Um, so in that case, it's very still in an experimental phase, I guess. Uh, but we have uh, two different, uh, three different tests for, uh, for that purpose. But yeah, again, we do not offer like uh, the rainbow and the other tests. Nice, great, and and the invitation is also you know I, I would like to to repeat your invitation to contribute to your package using YouTube. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. So that's um, there's another question for Zevanti 
going back to her presentation, uh, Chris Ryan would like to know if Lookout works well for disease surveillance. Um, for example, daily, weekly, or monthly frequencies of a reportable disease, uh, if you can use the package to find excess counts. I, I haven't used it on disease surveillance at this point, like both Rob and I haven't, so this is joint work with Rob. So uh, the, the uh, uh, we, so this is uh, on generally, like we, we did it on IID data, like, you know, general rectangular. So if it is like a time series that we need to take into account the autocorrelation, which we have not done at this point, but we are interested in, in uh, doing that application because then it will be, uh, you know, it, it, then it's, it's a nice step. So we, we haven't done the time series aspect of it as yet. It's just in the IID case. Yeah, but, but that'll be a really good application. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, I do have one more question uh, for Martin. So is, is the package part of your dissertation work or is this a project parallel to your PhD work? And if it is, um, um, again, I'm going to ask the same question that I asked the first presenters. How, as a PhD, you have you find the time to to produce the package, and how do you manage uh, that? Well, interesting. The package uh, wasn't um, planned to be part of my dissertation, but it's going to be now because it was as as you already said. Like, how do I find the time? Um, so the, this package grew and grew in scope, and you know, you 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 work on a, on some software, and you're like, well, I want to do this more general, so it's like generally applicable. And then you add this and add that, and suddenly you have like uh, worked for this on months. And uh, so this was um, supposed to be just a little tool, but now it's it's going to be in there in some way. So I'm going to publish this, and it's going to be a, uh, like a published software in that sense, and it's going to be part of it. Yeah. And to what do find the time? It's yeah. It's uh, by by making it part of other research things that I'm doing. So I, it's basically I'm. Um, um, using using the time that I'm supposed to work on something else, by by making this package part of it, and then I just will solve my other problem by making the package nicer. I guess this is this is the way to do it in a PhD here. <laughs> no, but it's it's great that you have the chance to get recognized by your work because yeah, uh, it's, it's, one it's, big issue in software development, at least in academia, is that you don't get uh, proper credit sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I think this is, this is generally um, an important thing to like, make this possible. And I'm, and I'm very lucky to be in a research group where this is encouraged. And I think it's, it's something good because in the end, everybody wins when there's good software, right? Correct. Thank you, Martin. I think Alcevandi has a question for you. Yeah, I'm Martin, re really interested in the work. Uh, so the package means, uh, I'm not going to phrase it. So they, they, is, is it, how is it different from the package GA? Because there are packages for genetic algorithms and optimization. Yeah, so um, I think the, the additional benefit here is that it's more flexible as in like it um, gives you these um, objects. It's built in R6 and these objects you can um, they, they, you can specify very, very, um, like very precisely what what your operations are supposed to be, like how to mutate, how to recombine, and each of this is given to you as a building block in um, as an R six object. So you can basically build your own um, your own algorithm very specifically on what what you want to do. And in particular, this this way of combining operators that I had to jump over a bit, unfortunately, it, it's very powerful because you can have like a search space where like some of the um, parameter, like things are categorical, others are numeric and maybe integer valued, and you do different kinds of operations on the different parts of your search space. I think this, um, like obviously you can you can also like write this in other packages, but they don't have this as a primary um, like as a primary goal. And this is this is uh, we're trying to. Um, well, optimize problems that have search spaces that are, would you would have difficulties with another packages, I think. Great. Thank you, Martin. Um, I believe we don't have any other questions, um, but please, uh, to all the presenters, uh, thank you so much again 
for your participation and uh, please feel free to keep interacting with people in the Slack channel. The Slack channel will continue to be open for other sessions in the same topic today and tomorrow. Uh, but I've added uh, your information as presenters and your packages, so hopefully there will be more interaction after people watch this video on YouTube. Thank you so much to all, and uh, have a nice conference.